want you to think back with me if you're able to. Maybe this hasn't happened to you before. Maybe you're right in the midst of it. But I want you to think back to your first date. <laughs> Art, let's keep it, let's keep it PG-13, please. If, if, if you think back, maybe your first date was like mine. It happened when I was in junior high school. And the, the fun part of that is you had this butterfly feeling, you know, this gutsy thing going on. You call the girl, and by the grace of God, she said yes, and it was going to be a homecoming dance. And I remember the next day at school, it's kind of really odd. You don't know what to say to them. You're just kind of walking around. You see them, you kind of... You know, because you're a little shy. You're not sure about this dance thing anyway because you don't dance. And, and so then the next thing you know, uh, you go over to pick them up. Now, my parents had this really cool car. I believe it was a Monte Carlo at the time, but it was a two-door. And it had these cool captain's chairs in the front. So we were styling. But the cool feature of these captain's chairs is you had a button that you could pull down and you could twist around. And so that particular evening, I pulled up to the house with my mother driving because I didn't have a license, of course. And so I walk up to the house, and you've got that, you know, you've got that cold corsage that you pulled out of the refrigerator, right? Because your mother told you to, because you knew nothing about it anyway. And so then you get to pin that corsage on in front of her parents. Awkward. And so now we come out, and we go to, to get in the car. I've got the seat turned around so she can ease into the back, so you know, we can ride up to Capitol Heights with my arm around her, and all my buddies see me out there and everything. And she sits in the front seat. giving me the opportunity to slide in the back and then move the chair around so we can go, you know. And so there we come, riding up to the school. Of course, all my friends are hanging out outside that don't have days to see who came with who. And here it is, my date and my mother. <laughs> and me in the back seat. Well, as we get older, hopefully yours went better than that, but as we get older, maybe around, uh, maybe even as early as high school and beyond, if you do that, you, maybe you start dating someone and you have that, that awkward feeling of saying, hey, do you... Do you want to be exclusive? Now, there are all kinds of classifications for it now, but we used to call it, would, you know, would you go with me? And that basically meant that, will you be my boyfriend or will you be my girlfriend? And so that was awesome when that happened. And if that stays together long enough, you might even reach a place where, you know, you fall in love with them. And because you don't have to be in love to go together, right? That's what I always kid my kids about that are dating. Hey, have y'all got to that uh, I love you part? They love it when I ask them that in front of everybody. And so maybe you stay together and you fall in that love part and you become engaged. And then all of a sudden, after that engagement, you start picking out the date. And the, the wedding eventually comes and, and all these great things are happening. And then the day after the wedding, what comes after that? Well, probably the need for a whole lot of forgiveness. If you're like most marriages, at some point after that wedding and the honeymoon that someone pointed out, there needs to be a lot of forgiveness extended if you want to have a strong relationship. You see, the willingness to forgive, and that's our main point today, the willingness to forgive critically impacts relationships. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is going to be something that takes place with all relationships. No matter where you are, I think there's something that you'll get from this because it's going to come from the Word of God, and the Word of God is never left void. And so we're going to really put the laser, though, on marriage. Now, last week we learned a lot about second chances and forgiveness. If you weren't here, we got a few good points from people like Adam Hamilton. And if you want to turn on your worship guide, I've given you some note places that you didn't have last week that you may want to write these down because these are going to play an important role in all of this second chance series. We learned that there were two dimensions to forgiveness. Our willingness to ask for it and secondly, our willingness to extend it. Now, I'm pretty sure that everybody in here at some point has needed to handle both dimensions of forgiveness, a time in which you've needed to ask for it. And as I look around the room, I see a few people that have probably had to do that a lot more than others. Some may have needed to extend it more often, but we both had to do that, I'm sure. And then we were told about the six words that we rec were recommended that we master that goes really close alongside this whole idea of forgiveness. The first group of three is I am sorry. We've all had to say that, haven't we? There are probably times we probably needed to say it and we didn't, isn't there? The second group of three happens to be I forgive you. So if we're going to try to get this whole 
idea of relationships, wherever you are, but especially in marriage, we're going to have to learn about the willingness to ask for forgiveness, the willingness to extend it, the willingness to be able to say, hey, uh, I'm sorry, and also I forgive you. So why does forgiveness critically impact all relationships, but especially marriage? Well, here's why. I want you to think about it for a minute. You take two people that are really different, they don't know each other to begin with, and they live most of their life up until you meet them, learning and being one particular person. Some people can even be set in their ways depending on their age. Now, I don't know how many of you are set in your ways or were when you got married, but there's a, probably a high probability. Jim, were you set in your ways? No? And, of course, the missus is saying, oh, yeah. Another thing, each person has their own quirks. Imagine what, what Melinda has to put up with with Dave. <laughs> we have our own quirks, and, and now each person comes with certain routines. They fall in love, and then we try to say, oh, we're going to overlook all their faults until we're married, and then I'll make them right. How'd that work out for you? Being the Messiah is a tough place to be. And so then, once we're married, you're together every day. You're in a small, confined space all the time, and now you really get to know one another in a way that you never did before you were in such a tight place. Will you get the picture? One commentator, and we believe this here at this church, we need to be transparent. Marriage and really any relationship is really hard work. In fact, the divorce rate attests to that fact. That's just the way it is. One person noted that the only reason marriages last is because they just work through sheer persistence, determination, and especially by forgiving one another for their faults. Last week, we learned that when we discuss forgiveness, there's a close tie-in to something called sin. Remember that? But we're going to talk about it two weeks in a row. Everybody okay with that? Sin. And what we learned with sin was that in the Old Testament, it was kind of translated from the Hebrew, if you're into that, it was translated to basically stray from the path, which tells us there's a path. There's something we're supposed to be following, right? And then in the New Testament, it was translated into to miss the mark. So somewhere there's a target out there in some way. And that we should be aiming for, and what we need to be aiming for is a healthy marriage or a healthy relationship. That's the path. But too often, if you're like me, whenever there's a path... There are times when you may stray from it, and you need to get back on course. Well, Adam Hamilton challenges us, if that's ever the case, that we get out our shovels and we really dig into the book of Colossians. They really dig and look in there and see what it has to say. Now, for those of you that are thinking about going to seminary, I'll give you a little bit here that you can carry with you if you want to go there. The book, we believe, was written by the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul was not always a great guy, but once he literally saw the light, everything changed. So much so that we believe that about 70% of the New Testament is either written by or about the Apostle Paul. That's how great of a guy he was. Well, he's going to write this letter to the city of Colossae, a leading city in Asia Minor, which would now be Turkey. But by the first century, it had diminished to just a second-rate market town. But here's the problem. There's a heresy going on in Colossa. And so he writes a letter to the people there. The church there would be known as the book of Colossians. And so he writes there because they're talking down the importance of Christ. Paul will not have that. He probably gives them three snaps on that and says, that's not going to happen. In fact, Christ is adequate. Christ is supreme, and so he writes the letter to them to tell them that, and that's the way kind of the letter begins. He begins by thanking them, and that's the way Paul will usually address whatever church he's sending to. Hey, thank you for all your hard work. But listen to this. If Paul's writing a letter to you, he can say thank you all he wants to. You know at some point the shoe is about to drop. And so he writes the letter to them, thanking them at first and letting them know that they have been in his prayers. And then he moves on to the supremacy of Christ and that Christ is adequate and Christ is adequate alone. And then he starts to talk about the hard work that faces the church 
And then about the importance of being free from human regulations. And then we hit chapter 3. Chapter 3 is going to really be the bedrock for us. And so I want you to turn your Bibles, if you have them, to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 12 through 15. But what I want you to listen to while you're looking for those is that, at least in the NIV version, it says these are rules for holy living. It was written about community living because the community of God is so important. And I want to reiterate that this morning, how important the community is. When I got the news of Terry, we as a, a, a body of believers, I mean, we came together about that. And I, 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 I don't know, for some reason when I, when I hear people leaving the church over small insignificant issues, placing so much weight on just a, a few minutes out of the week on Sunday morning, I think, wow. You have not embraced community and what that means. Community. That's what it's about, people. It's about community. It's not about any one segment of church life. It's about the entire picture called community. Well, here's what it says about that. And I believe that as we look at these, you're going to hear six qualities of a healthy marriage or relationship. You can do with it what you please, but certainly today for a marriage. It says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. Now, if you're reading out of the King James, gentleness might be translated as meekness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Sometimes we forget that. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. I hope you didn't miss those. Because if you'll take those six and apply them in your life to any relationship, but especially marriage, you're going to have fantastic results, maybe. <laughs> and we'll get into that in just a moment. But the quality is compassion. Defined feeling of deep sympathy. How many times in our marriages or other relationships have we looked back and said, you know what, mm, I should have been a little more compassionate with that. I shouldn't have said it that way. I should have been more compassionate. Or kindness. A quality of being warm-hearted and considerate. How many times have we done something in our marriage that we look and realize, you know, that really wasn't considerate on my part? Or humility, the modest opinion of one's own importance. How many times in relationships and marriages do we put ourselves higher than our spouse or higher than someone else when we could look back and say, you know what, I needed to humble myself and not see myself as the greater partner in that situation. Or meekness. Having a disposition to be patient or gentleness, being considerate. Anybody here with me that has had times in their marriage or other relationships where you just weren't considerate? You just spoke out and you said, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And then there's patience. Good-natured tolerance. How many times in our marriages have we just been a little bit patient and humble and not jumped to a conclusion and just sat back and just kind of let it work its way out, especially the things that really didn't make a hill of beans difference? And if we could just use that trait, then that would have been so much better. So that's five. That's five. And there's your path. That's your path. If you can kind of gain traction on those five, you're going to really do something. But what happens with me when there's a path, because I'm a knucklehead, sometimes I'll ease over here off that path a little bit, and then comes in number six, forgiveness. Forgiveness. You see, if you want a second chance in marriage and other relationships, you may want to go from Scripture and look and see how you're doing on these six, or especially five. You may need to use the sixth one. Well, we've always said that there are going to be times that we need to say, I'm sorry, I forgive you, I'm willing to extend it, I'm willing to try to receive it. Because willingness to forgive someone critically impacts relationships. Now, Andy Stanley, if you're a fan of Andy Stanley, says that there are certain 
guidelines, guardrails, if you will, that you can place in your life, in your marriage, that will keep you from straying from the path to begin with and having to use that number six of forgiveness. And I decided to add some of my own that Julie and I have. And I realize that most of you probably have never sat down with your spouse or maybe it's an important relationship in your life and say, you know what, we want to create a standard. This is what we're going to do so that we don't stray from the path. The first one, that, and these are all just mixed in, so for Julie and I, we avoid bars. Now, it, it, it really hurts me to say that's not biblical. <laughs> but the reason is, is because even if you go to a bar and you're not drinking, whenever someone else is in there drinking or they're inebriated, then they have a possibility of saying things to your wife or to your husband that they wouldn't normally say. It can cause an incredible, terrible situation to make you say and do things that you wouldn't normally do. Now, again, this is not in Scripture, but Julie and I don't drink for that same reason. Because when you start drinking, you start doing things that you don't want to do. Uh, sometimes I think people will say, well, you know, I, I don't drink to get drunk. Well, why aren't you drinking tea? Well, I like the taste. No, we like the buzz. So I think about that whole idea. Hey, you know, don't drink. If you do, it's not scriptural not to, by the way. Okay, so hear that. But don't drink in excess. That is scriptural. Then be careful. I've talked about this before. Julie and I aren't on Facebook. If you are, be real careful with that. Surround yourself with godly couples. That's, that's one I can't say enough. Surround yourself with godly couples so that whenever you're in a situation or choose a godly couple as a mentor, so whenever you're in that situation, that you can ask them, hey, you know, this is what's happening with us. Uh, what did you all do? And let them mentor you. I never ride with someone of the opposite sex alone. That's just good ministerial ethics, and it's just good ethics in general, because if somebody sees you, then there's all these rumors that start. I never eat at a table with someone of the opposite sex either for what it might look like. Now, we decided a long time ago here at Friendship that we would be authentic. And this is the maybe part that I spoke of earlier. Because a marriage and good relationships require two people, that means that you can be doing everything right. And the other party can do something stupid. And so you can follow all of these yourself and still end up on the short end of the stick. This week, I heard a story that was very similar to that. It was about love. It was about marriage, it was about betrayal, and it was about second chances. And it came from one of our own members. And I'm going to ask if they would, if they would come up at this time and share that story. It's an incredible story. Please listen. Thanks, Tony. Um, July of this year, uh, of 2013 in July, we, I, Sherry and I will have been married 22 years. God has been good to her. <laughs> Those of you who know us know that that is absolutely not the truth. God has been good to me. I'm the one that married way up. And, and that it's just been, uh, I'm so thankful for my wife and my kids and the life that, uh, the, the blessing that God has poured into my life. But before... Before this, 22 years, and a season of dating and a little season, season of there, I, part of my life I shared with Tony as we were discussing our, uh, this sermon. And um, some of you have heard part of this story. Some of you, maybe you've never heard it. I've got to give you the quick, condensed version of a much longer story. But here's, how it, here's a little bit how it goes. For years previous to all of that, uh, I was married to another young lady. We married, met her in my hometown. She had moved there from Tennessee, and we had married, and, and her and her family actually were, was, it was a big part of uh, my coming to Christ because uh, I'd gone to church a little bit, you know, mostly to kind of every now and then and to check out the girls at youth group and stuff like that. I mean, that was, that was kind of about the extent of the reason why I was involved in that, but her and her family were pretty were faithful in the church, and I went with them, and God began to deal with me and spoke spoke to my heart, changed my life. But we uh, we were married, and about three years, the first three years of that, 
moved to Huntsville. I was working for Coca-Cola. She had her own job. We were living, uh, looked seemed like what was typical standard kind of life for about the first three years. Everything seemed to be going very well. And then somewhere in that fourth year, things began to be different, and I didn't quite understand them. I know hindsight is twenty twenty, but at the time, I began to see these things that were happening and decisions that were being made and different things that were just kind of, you know, you kind of go, what? And then, but you just move on because you just don't think about it at the moment. But things like where we had always been involved, I got, we'd gotten involved in a church when we moved to Huntsville to the point, I mean, involved heavily, which we've always, I've always been since I gave my life to Christ. And um, somewhere in the midst of that, um, my wife decided that for some reason she didn't want to go to church anymore. And I'm like, what? What is that? That that doesn't make any sense, you know. Well, I'm going. Whether you go or not, that'll be up to you, but I'm going. And that was just kind of one of the pictures, one of the pieces of the puzzle that wasn't making sense at the time. And then now, it, you know, it's 20 hindsight. Things make a lot more sense. But between that and then I used to work where I would be all over the North Alabama repairing Coke equipment and things. And then. When I would be in Huntsville, during lunchtime, I would always call her and say, hey, let's, uh, let's go to lunch. Why don't we meet? I'm, I'm in town today. Let's go to lunch. We do that a lot. And then all of a sudden, it got to be where, no, we can't go. No, i got to stay at work. It's just they're killing us here, and I'm going to have to work through lunch, and I'll just get something out of the machine or whatever, and I'll be okay, that kind of thing. So, you know, all of that. And that happened several times. And um, so one day... That happened. She said, no, i got to work, all this stuff. So I said, I was really close to where she works. So I said, I'm going to get something and go and uh, just take her something at work. And uh, maybe we can sit in the cafeteria and eat and stuff. So when I pulled up at work, when I pulled up at her job place, uh, I could not find our car in the parking lot. Now all of a sudden, Things started rushing in, which had never happened before. Never, I'd never had any doubt or weirdness or anything, just, you know, kind of like things I told you before. I was like, what, what is this about? And so I decided that, so I, in, in the midst of everything pouring into my, into my head and wondering what in the world was going on, I decided that, I'd heard this name several times come up in innocent conversation, um, you know, at home and stuff, just how this, you know, oh, you, you never guess what happened today and this, that, and the other. And, you know, little things like um, you know, Alabama-Tennessee game. We were Tennessee fans. They were Alabama fans. He was an Alabama fan. She came home with an Alabama hat on because Tennessee lost. They'd made a bet. Not, it, see what I'm saying? It was just kind of an innocent little things that was just weird, but I never thought about it. So all this stuff started crashing in, and I said, you know what? I'm going to find out where this guy lives. So I got a phone book, and I chose to, and I looked up his address, and in my little red Coca-Cola utility pickup truck, here I go out through these residential neighborhoods trying to find where this place was. And so as I rode into this neighborhood and back in the neighborhood, made a right turn on this road, rounded a curve, there sat my car in a driveway. Now, I don't know how you handle things, but I don't handle things very well. But in that moment, I came, I was, I was in a complete state of shock and just kept, just kept driving, freaking out, not knowing what to do. Lunchtime was over. I had that, that piling on me, and I had to be back at my job. And so I ran back to my job, and I said, to my boss, I said, I need you to give me my, I need you to give me my calls and let me go. I just got to go. Just, can I go ahead and get mine? Just please give them to me. I got to go. And he's like, what is wrong with you? Why are you, 
sit down here. I'm like, I hang, I, I can't. I can't sit down. I just need my, I need my calls and I need to go. And about that time, the secretary buzzed in the office and said, Joe, do you have a phone call? So I left. I picked up the phone. And it was my wife on the other line saying, can you take the rest of the afternoon off? We need to talk. And so that afternoon started a, 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 a nine-month process that I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about God. Because you see, right at the first front end of all of this, I wasn't handling things very well. She said, maybe I just need to move out into my house with my sister, which her sister didn't want her to do. She was... Not in agreement with any of this. But she let her move in. And uh, on that very first day, I mean, I was going through those stages of loss really quickly. The denial quickly turned to anger. And the things that were rushing through my head was, I'll just kill them both. I'll just, I mean, that's just where I was. And... The anger turned then to a place. It lasted for just a little while, but it turned to a place where I began to the next step of begin to bargaining with, trying to bargain with her and trying to bargain with God because I realized that I found myself in a place where I had zero control from this moment on. And I had a choice. I could either forgive and walk completely and totally dependent upon God to do a miracle in, in our situation or I could choose something totally different. And that's the choice I made. God, I fell to my knees and said, God, I need you. I have nothing else. And I will do whatever it takes. I will do whatever it takes to make my marriage work. And in the midst of that time, for the next several months of serious depression and serious, I, my running to God and spending time with him was at the forefront. And you know what the biggest part of that time with God was? was moving me to a place where I could live in the forgiveness that he had extended to me. That was hard. Eight months into this, a, um, what's this, a sheriff shows up at my workplace, and I pull up at the end of the day, and he's there to see me to deliver divorce papers that uh, I had, you know, that, that's just what they did. And on the very same day, the, the divorce papers had no longer been in my hand until I could get back to my area where I was working, and the phone was ringing, and it was her. And she said, I have made a tremendous mistake. Can I come home? Wow. God, can I tell you something? If you don't leave here with anything, God can work miracles in your situation if you'll position yourself to allow him to do so. Please hear that. Of course, I said, absolutely. Absolutely. And she came home, and for the next three days, we probably had the three best days of our entire relationship. Just time together and talking with one another. And the best time ever. And then to this day, I still don't even know what happened. But at the end of, on the fourth day, going to work, sky high, 
thanking God for all that he's doing, work, beginning to realize what it was going to take to work to make things work. She comes home at the end of the fourth day and says, maybe we're rushing into this too fast. And I, I, my life, from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, now to the lowest it's ever been. She grabbed her things, moved back out in with her sister. And from that point on, it was like a free fall off the edge. She went and filed divorce papers. They show up, lay on my table. 60 days later, they go into effect or 30 days. I can't remember. Something like that. But I share that story with you, and I'm going to ask Tony to come up because he's going to share. I share that story with you for this reason. Is that I brought absolutely nothing to the table. But what I did see is that when I was willing to put myself in a position to see God work and to give him control of a situation, that's when amazing things happen. Now, did it work out like I expected it to? Absolutely not. But I'm going to tell you what. God restored and returned to me a hundredfold of what I had before. In my wife. In my three amazing children. God has been good to me. And I look back at that time in my life, which was the worst time of my life up to this point. I don't know what the future holds, but I know that season, that nine months, was the very worst time of my life. But it was also in weird ways how the Bible says that God takes all things and uses them for the good. That God used that situation in my life to do some amazing good things in me and in the lives of people around, around me. So can I encourage you? I don't know where you find yourself today. But this whole forgiveness thing is absolutely real. And it's absolutely necessary to put yourself in a position to see God do something extraordinary in your life. Amen. Thank you, brother. As the band comes out, I want to give you some next steps. For anyone here that might be needing a second chance or trying to get to a place where they don't need one, number one, you can look on the back. Evaluate where you stand with the six qualities of a healthy relationship. You've heard them directly from Scripture. It's for community living. It's for relationships. It's for marriages. Number two, create a list of standards to protect your relationship. Sit down with your spouse or whomever you're having a relationship with. If you're just dating, sit down and see what that's going to look like. Number three, ask for or extend forgiveness in any relationship that needs it so that you can move on. You see, your willingness to forgive critically impacts relationships. You're going to have an opportunity here in just a few minutes, and I know we're going to run a couple minutes uh, over, but you're going to have a, a chance to come forward if there's anyone here that needs to be forgiven for anything. If you know somebody that needs to ask for forgiveness, or if you need forgiveness or something in your relationship, it doesn't matter. Just the altar is going to be open to come and pray. So I want to encourage you to do that at this time. If you need that or if you know someone that does, please, please don't hesitate. Pray from your seats, whatever you feel comfortable with.